Welcome once more to DBD TV, the Dragon Ball Dissection spin-off wherein we look at the animated adaptation of Dragon Ball. Last time we re-explored the Cell Arc, which brings us here, to the in-between. The Anoyoichi Budokai Arc, or roughly the number one in the Afterlife Tournament, aired from July 28, 1993 to September 1, 1993. As far as the manga goes, that's between Trunks humiliating Idasa and Trunks humiliating Mr. Satan. Goku and Kaio's adventures in the other world take them to the planet of the Dai Kaio. Ultimately, Goku participates in a tournament against the dead warriors of all worlds, allowing him to see just how big and strange the universe really is. Once again, Toei has decided to add original material in between major story arcs. That's nothing new. Every arc break with a time skip has done it. Some, like Goku's training for various tournaments and his pre-wedding crisis, have been episodic adventures tied together by a common thread. The Garlic Jr. arc, which we looked at two years ago, served as a battle to save the world story in miniature, condensing the type of narrative told in, say, the Frieza arc to a mere ten episodes. Here, we get a tournament arc pared down to five episodes. The fact of the matter is, this is one of those stories that just never sticks with me. I'm not going to claim I've watched it a large number of times, but even so, I feel like I'm caught in a time loop with this. I come into it thinking, wow, I barely remember what happens in this, but I don't recall it being that great. A lot of people seem to like it though, so I'm sure I will this time. Then I watch it, my reaction is, eh and then I forget all the details again. It's taken me until now to figure out why that is. Hopefully, by the time we get to the end of this video, you'll understand too. But here's a good place to start. Like the Garlic Jr. arc, I think it's fair to say there are two distinct halves to this story. One half is fairly charming and potentially attention-grabbing. And the other half is... kinda dull. I'm not trying to be too predictable here, but you've probably already guessed what I like and what I don't. All in good time, friends. All in good time. Like all of the previous filler excursions, excluding the Garlic Jr. arc, this storyline asks the question, what is Goku doing in between his big adventures? In a general sense, after several years of Goku's use as a plot device savior, I find it so refreshing for him to actually be the focus of a story again. But this is an especially intriguing question at this point in Dragon Ball, since Goku is dead and is basically getting the freedom to explore the next world for the first time. He's no longer under a deadline. This is now, for lack of a better term, where he lives. Wow, I just did two of those. Given that the circumstances that led him here are established as Goku's exit from the series, this could be said to be a happy little coda on Goku's story. That he may be dead, but the challenge to improve himself continues on for eternity. That Goku, over the span of these episodes, is unable to achieve what he sets out to do, but is ultimately undaunted in the face of potentially thousands of years of work, is what makes Goku so charming. That's certainly the most appropriate thematic cap you can give his journey. It's a nice sentiment, but at this point in the manga, Goku had already returned to the story, so I'm not sure how much that coda was already undermined by mid-1993. However, another draw to setting a storyline in this environment is a chance to expand upon the mythology of Dragon Ball's afterlife. Not only are the familiar trappings of the afterlife established in both Toriyama's and Toei's versions of Dragon Ball revisited here, but many new locations, mechanics, and characters are introduced too. After all, this is a story where Kaio takes Goku to the planet of his superior, the Dai, or Grand Kaio. There he meets other deceased warriors and Kaio's counterparts from the other three galaxies. This arc revels in making the afterlife as wondrous and odd as possible, and I love it for that. You never know what you're going to see from one moment to the next. There's a whole cosmos behind an ordinary looking door, so let's just put a tournament here. Goku and the Eastern Kaio take a timeout to stage a race? All kinds of weird character designs and moves are on display. I love the video game images used to illustrate the rules of the tournament. There is a lot here to hook an audience, as long as they're interested in learning more details of Dragon Ball's world. If you've been watching my videos on the Boo arc, you'll know I've already gone over some of these details there. 
Elements of this storyline cross over into Toriyama Akira's Dragon Ball manga. The Southern Kaio receives an early bird but seven years late cameo in the manga a matter of weeks before he's introduced here. And much of the godly hierarchy established here is later introduced in Toriyama's series when Piccolo confronts Shin, despite these characters serving no role in that story. It's an odd recursive gesture. It would be as if the Saiyan arc had a line after Goku died explaining what role Anin's Furnace of Eight Divinations played in bringing him to the afterlife. Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Toriyama played a hand in devising many of the other world elements seen here. You might recall that I recently showed off Toriyama's sketch of the cosmos. While his placement of the Kaioshin realm would apparently be added later, he says in Daizenshu 4 that he initially came up with it at the behest of the anime staff, presumably for this story. And yes, the globe is introduced in the first episode of this mini-arc. Toriyama also claims to have come up with the idea of airplanes taking souls to heaven, which is really cute. And we know that he created the designs for the Grand Kaio and for Paikuhan, the story's antagonist. For whatever reason, the television staff really didn't want to make additions to the afterlife without Toriyama's input. And yet, somehow, this crap managed to make it through. Yes, the animated version of Hell returns with its bloody pond and mountain of needles, as Goku quickly learns that Cell, Frieza, and Frieza's henchmen are running amok down there, and decides he must stop them. What a blast from the past! Wakamoto Norio and Nakao Ryusei reprise their roles as Cell and Frieza, respectively. For some reason, Gordy Daisuke does not perform Cold's single line of dialogue, despite the fact that Gordy is already in this episode playing Enma. I don't really get that. And nobody else gets to talk. What, do you think we're made of money here? Even the two filler ogres, Gozu and Mezu, make cameo appearances. I will admit, though, this episode is not up to Studio Cockpit's usual standards. Going back to Hell is a fun idea, and it serves an important purpose. Before the idea of a tournament is even raised, this immediately establishes Paikuhan, the Western Kaio's prized pupil, as Goku's rival, as he takes out Cell in two hits. Unfortunately, this sequence doesn't make a lick of sense. The animated version of the Frieza arc established that Kaio had requested the four dead Ginyu members receive their bodies after death so that Yamcha and the others could train against them. Fair enough, although you'd think that privilege would be rescinded after the training was over. But even assuming that was overlooked, why do any of the rest of these idiots have their bodies? If Frieza has had his body and his henchmen all this time, what's he been doing until now? Why does he need Cell to motivate him? Obviously, the answer is because this story beat couldn't happen if they didn't have their bodies, so they have their bodies. And they're staging this rebellion now because we're following Goku, and Goku happens to be here now. It would be nonsensical enough already, but not ten minutes earlier, the same episode made a huge deal out of reminding us that Goku getting to keep his body is a special service, and that other dead people exist as little spirit clouds. I'm beginning to realize this episode does not think very highly of my intelligence. Also, how are Goku and Paikuhan so casually flying into hell? Once you go down there, you're not supposed to be able to get back out again, right? I mean, I guess Goku already knows about the secret exit, ah, whatever. Yes, that does mean we once again get to see Enma doing his job as Judge of Souls. Even before the manga gets around to it, we see that he has updated his welcome sign. I'm proud of him for working on his English, but I'm a little disappointed because I have the sense of humor of a 12-year-old. What's weird here is what has changed with the ogres who work for Enma. Toriyama introduces them as salarymen in button-ups and ties. For reasons I can't figure out, they're not dressed like that anymore. Instead, they're dressed like... I think they're dressed like the medical staff from Shock Treatment. You know, Shock Treatment, the little-known sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show? No? Okay. All I can say is that I would feel ill at ease if I found myself recently deceased, only to come face-to-face -face with these outfits. Another similarity between this and Goku's other filler adventures is that most of the main cast is pushed out of the story in favor of a bunch of new characters, most of whom we'll never see again. I tend to find that a refreshing change of pace, and at least most of these new characters are interesting enough to warrant this excursion. 
it is a joy to see Kaio at the center of a Dragon Ball plot. Here's a funny bit of trivia for you from the original run of animated Dragon Ball. Aside from Nozawa Masako's various members of Goku's family, actors in the anime would only be credited for a single character per episode, and it's almost always their most important role. For example, it's rare you ever see a voice credit for Yajirobe. That's because he's portrayed by Tanaka Mayumi, the voice of Kuririn. Outside of the Piccolo arc, they mostly appear in the same episodes, and since Kuririn is more prominent, Yajirobe just doesn't get credited. Kaio is voiced by Yanami Joji, who has played, well, lots of characters, including Dr. Brief, Earth's King, and Bobby D. But he also plays the narrator, who appears in every single episode, meaning his characters don't make it in the cast list. This is the exception. In these five episodes, Yanami is credited both for the narration and as the Northern Kaio. That should tell you something right there. Kaio and Goku make quite the comedy duo here. Kaio is equal parts put upon straight man and bemused observer of Goku's antics. I love the moment in the first episode where Goku's excitement over meeting strong guys causes him to continue to run off before he has learned everything he needs to. Goku running backwards along the serpentine road is cute by itself, but it's so charming not only seeing Kaio begin to predict that Goku is going to come back, but becoming increasingly amused at its reoccurrences. On the flip side is the moment where an annoyed Kaio has to literally drag Goku to the fighting arena by the bone Goku was eating and refuses to stop biting down on. There's a great chemistry between these two characters, which justifies why Kaio continues to make appearances, despite having largely been superseded in his mentor role. These episodes wonderfully demonstrate Kaio's function and character in greater detail than we've ever seen. Well, look, let's just go ahead and take off the table the problems of Kaio's all too recent assertions that he's the most important being ever. Hell, let's ignore the assertions in these episodes that the Grand Kaio is. Obviously, much of this is retroactively added nonsense that requires you to plug up your brain as to what has come before, and what will come after. But stories do that, and once you've accepted that, this works quite well. Seeing how effortlessly and casually Kaio interacts with Enma reinforces God's earlier statement that Kaio is stronger than him. On top of that, it's a wonderful juxtaposition to God's fearful reverence of Enma while in the same position. We get to see other former students of Kaio establishing a history of training that his experiences with Goku and friends have only ever implied. It almost gives credence to his line in the Cell arc that he has more to deal with than simply the Earth. And I say almost because, let's face it, the only student with whom he has any meaningful interaction is Goku. The rest of these guys are just here to be briefly exposited and then ignored. Something I quite enjoy in storytelling is seeing a character through a new perspective. Characters are often presented in a role in relation to the focal point of the story. Kaio is a god, a teacher, and we've only ever seen him in positions wherein he demands respect. That's why that scene with Enma is important. It re-establishes the order to which we are accustomed so that when it's turned on its head, it has a bigger impact. And yeah, it is so turned on its head. Sure, we have Kaio deferring to his superior, the Grand Kaio, but again, that's the same thing we saw with Kamisama and Enma Dayo, right down to the lesser god correcting Goku's level of politeness. What's new here is getting to see Kaio as a peer, alongside his equals and how they treat him. Truth be told, the number one in the Afterlife Tournament is actually the Kaio of the North dying commemorative number one in the Afterlife Tournament. The whole thing is a pseudo-celebratory effort on the part of the three other Kaio in order to humiliate him for dying. In particular, our Kaio seems to have a rather bitter rivalry with the Western Kaio, which makes it inevitable that Paikuan comes from his galaxy. If the teachers are rivals, so too are the students. Their squabbling persists through the story arc to the point where there's a shot of Paikuan that seems to suggest the students are going to say the hell with this and mutiny against their petty overlords who want to make them fight. Sadly, nothing so interesting ever happens in this arc, but we'll get to that in a minute. Seeing Kaio teased by his counterparts from the other galaxies is both a refreshing new perspective and almost a little sad. We're used to him being in charge, so witnessing him bullied, however good-naturedly, is like seeing your parents cry for the first time. 
It also gives us greater motivation to want to see Goku win because we want to see our Kaio win. The Grand Kaio himself is also pretty fun, albeit a bit predictable. I mean, how many times have we been introduced to Great Masters who are far more laid-back, casual, and silly than their stations would suggest? Heck, Kaio himself is one of them, as we're reminded by their shared love of 50s automobiles. The Grand Kaio goes a step further by having a throne made in the style of a car, complete with pedals. He also has a few verbal tics, such as adding the cutesy honorific Chan onto everyone's name as well as mixing up syllables of words for silly effect. For example, he calls Hell, which is Jigoku in Japanese, Kujigo instead. All in all, these are fun characters, certainly fun enough to carry the few episodes they're in. Unfortunately, those are all the characters who aren't fighting. Yes, what an incredible shock. I find the least interesting part of this tournament arc to be the tournament itself. The idea of holding a tournament at this point in the series is not altogether ill-advised. Sure, on the surface it feels hopelessly redundant, being sandwiched in between two other tournaments. Still, the Cell Games, for any of its other merits, utterly fails at being a tournament, barely making use of any of those trappings, and ultimately becoming exactly the same as any other battle to save the planet. The 25th Tenkaichi Budokai, while far better executed as a tournament, is still only a means to an end. So even though this area of animated Dragon Ball is positively suffocating in tournaments, there is a niche this could fill, on top of the exciting novelty of getting to see fighters from across the universe, which this certainly has. The problem is, the Anoyoichi Budokai arc doesn't seem all that invested in having a tournament. And, you know, since its bookend counterparts end up with the same problem, it gives this little opportunity to stand out among them. This tournament exists as a framework on which to hang jokes, and as a means for an ultimate showdown between Goku and Paikuhan. Unfortunately, most of the jokes aren't quite funny enough to justify all this pageantry, and let me just go ahead and say it, Paikuhan is definitely not an interesting enough antagonist to carry a tournament arc. Gee, I guess some lessons are never learned. As far as I see it, what makes tournament arcs work is a combination of meeting fun new characters who have fun new martial arts abilities. Those two things often work in tandem. Namu's fighting style reflects his character. Manwolf's actions are influenced by his motivation. Even though we don't spend a lot of time with them, their fights teach us enough to be invested and entertained for the period we are. Now imagine a Tenkaichi Budokai where Bluma, Oolong, and Puar are the most interesting characters. I mean, that's great. I love when they get to do stuff, but is that really where the focus needs to be right now? This tournament puts all of its eggs in the martial arts abilities basket at the complete expense of the fun new characters basket. There is not a single character in this tournament who is worth a damn. Because of that, the fun abilities can only take you so far. And let me be clear, there are a few abilities that are at least entertaining enough to carry their individual fight. Unfortunately, that's kind of damning with faint praise, because far and away my favorite fight in this tournament is Goku vs. Caterpie, which is a preliminary match. And that's really only because its conclusion, that Goku wins by default because Caterpie's transformation will take 1200 years to complete, is a funny punchline. Beyond that, though, they're simply okay at best, as one-note gags. Topica is really fast, with cartoon spinning legs. However, he's so small and shows off so much that he can't make it over to hit his opponent before he runs out of steam. Furag looks like Kermit and sounds like the Swedish chef. His special move is to blow himself up like a giant balloon to push his opponent out of bounds. Malaiko has to pick up the giant and deflate him. They're... fine. They're chuckle-worthy for a few moments, like the glossed-over children's matches that were going on at around the same time in the manga. But when the fights aren't played for comedy, they're just dull. Even the skills that are supposed to be taken seriously aren't all that special. They're only marginally interesting. Goku overcoming them is supposed to demonstrate his cleverness, but the solutions always seem obvious. Goku fights Aqua, a fish man with low self-esteem, literally the only characterization any of these guys gets, who can turn the ring into a body of water. Goku's solution is to fly out of the water. 
Paikuhan's ultimate move in the final match is the Thunder Flash. The name suggests storms or light or loud noises, so naturally it's a pillar of fire. It takes Goku three attempts to figure out a solution so obvious, it's literally a running joke in Dragon Ball Z abridged. Dodge. Then, you know, hit him. Like the junior division in the Boo arc, we only get the highlights of most of this tournament. There are only 16 competitors to begin with, and half of those are treated as preliminaries. That's fine. We only have five total episodes to work with. The major tournaments typically skim past those too but all four quarterfinals are rushed through in a single episode because this story isn't interested in anything but getting to Goku versus Paikuhan. Besides not getting to know any of these characters, the effect is that it ultimately feels like this is not thought through very well. Remember that these preliminaries are in front of an audience, just like everything else is. This isn't like the Tenkaichi Budokai, where preliminaries are done in private and split up into multiple blocks, so that competitors might not see each other until they get onto the main stage. Here, we're the only ones who don't get to see everything, so that perspective no longer applies. For some reason, they're still writing as though it is. When you start to think about it, you wonder, for example, if Aqua is so hopeless on land, how did he get out of the initial 16 without using his water skill? And if he did, why is anybody surprised to see it in his fight with Goku? If Topica is too small for the fighting stage, mightn't he have had to deal with that the first time he fought? Then there's the weird organization. Obviously, the story is setting up Goku and Paikuhan to fight each other in the final match. It's a foregone conclusion for the sake of the drama. Nothing wrong with that. But in the quarterfinals, both Goku and Paikuhan are presented in the second half. Their matches are one after the other. By all logic, they should square off in the semifinals, with that winner meeting either Tolby or Malaiko in the finals. But for some reason, they don't. The entire schedule is rejiggered between episodes with no explanation, just so Goku and Paikuhan can fight against each other at the end. For that matter, why is the announcer saying there are only four competitors from each galaxy, when it looks like there are about 136 slots on this board? Why is the Southern Kaio talking to 13 people when he should only have four fighters to start with? Why, during the montage of preliminaries, do we see matchups where neither competitor shows up in the finals? If they're only eliminating eight people, that should be impossible. Are they trying to imply that each Kaio oversees multiple galaxies? If so, no one told Goldilocks here because he earlier informs Goku that there are four galaxies total. There's just no thought here beyond getting to the end, with everything else just a gimmick to pass the time. Speaking of Goldilocks, the two fighters who get the most attention from the story are Paikuhan and Alevu. Alevu is the only other Northern Galaxy fighter besides Goku to make it into the finals, a beefcake who loses to Paikuhan pretty quickly. We learn nothing about him. His name is a pun on the word Olive because he's a vague representation of a Greek mythological figure. What he did to become a myth, we'll probably never know because Kaio just says that he's awesome. Seriously, Kaio gives more involved backstories to the random losers who don't do anything. It's the same for Paikuhan, he has no character. Remember, he is the whole reason we're skipping past everyone else, so he'd better be worth it. And he's not. We don't learn why he's special enough to keep his body and rub elbows with gods. He's just strong guy number 72. The closest thing to characterization he gets is that he reminds Goku of Piccolo by way of his design and the fact that he takes off his outer clothes when he gets serious. Is that really the best we can do? Where are the fun characters, the clever reversals, the motivations? This is nothing but novelty and jokes. Like I've said, a lot of the novelty and jokes are good. I can never remember anything that happens in any of these fights but I've never forgotten how it ends. The Grand Kaio panics at the thought he might have to train someone so strong, so even though Goku ultimately wins, he disqualifies both of them. He claims there's a rule that says you're not allowed to touch the ceiling, which they did, because if the ring were turned upside down, the ceiling would be the floor. Did he just make that up to save face? Who knows, but it's funny and the most memorable thing that happens in the tournament. 
So that's why the Ano Yoichi Budokai arc never sticks with me. It's because it's just okay. It's not terrible, but it's not great either. It's a fun little diversion for what it is. It occupies time in a vaguely entertaining way, but it doesn't leave much of an impression. Its world building is good, but that's why I always say that world building is the icing on the cake rather than the cake itself. It needs a good story to sustain it and justify it. There are so many interesting things around this story, which is why it's so disappointing that there isn't more of interest in it. It works so much better as a list of trivia for a guidebook. Let me go ahead and give you my list. Goku introduces a Kaioken Super Saiyan combination form. We see two Shamo and a Kanasen training in the afterlife. There's this guy who looks like Broly in the stands. There's a piece of music that plays during Goku's and the Eastern Kaios race that is only ever used one other time, way back in Dragon Ball Episode 3. As another example of how this seemingly wasn't thought through, the next episode preview leading into this arc shows Goku as a Super Saiyan fighting in Hell. Apparently they decided later on they wanted Goku's transformation to be a surprise in the tournament. So when the actual episode came around, they just recolored Goku's hair black. It still stands up, his eyes are still drawn closed, he still has the golden aura, he just has black hair. There's nothing else like this in all of Dragon Ball, and I'm pretty sure that's including the 75 new transformations Dragon Ball Super has introduced. Eh, I bet someone's going to tell me it was repurposed into a video game and called Quarter Pounder Super Saiyan or something ridiculous like that. While these are mostly new characters, many of them are cast with veteran Dragon Ball voice actors. The Western Kaio is voiced by Shimada Bin, Broly in the movies. The Southern Kaio is Nishio Toku, Mr. Popo. Alevu is Sato Masaharu, who also inexplicably performs that one line of cold I mentioned earlier. He sometimes plays King Vegeta, and he will eventually be chosen as the permanent replacement for Kame Senin after Miyauchi Kohei passes away. You'd never recognize that falsetto voice, but it's Suzuoki Hirotaka, Ten Shinhan, who plays the mushroom-headed announcer. This especially delights me given that he would soon be cast to replace Utsumi Kenji as the Tenkaichi Budokai announcer in the Boo arc. Finally, Midori Kawahikaru plays Paikuhan, fresh off of his role as Artificial Human Number 16. He would go on to play Ten Shinhan in 21st Century Dragon Ball after the death of Suzuoki. I think it's fun getting to see a brief scene of teenage Gohan heading to school in the final episode because it's underscored by a Chala Head Chala piece of music. Given that the show would change to a new theme and new music in the very next episode, this scene and the next episode preview feel like they have feet in two different worlds. Yeah, those are the things that interest me most about the Ano Yoichi Budokai arc. All the things that aren't the main story. It's a shame, because there's a lot of potential here, a lot of fun ideas. They just don't do much with them. Still, this makes enough of an impression to cross media, and, for whatever reason, Paikuhan must have been popular with somebody, given the prominent role he's going to play in the next movie we cover. You certainly don't see Tenlong or Shura getting that kind of treatment. But that movie is for another day. Our look at animated Dragon Ball comes to a close for a while. Look forward to a return to the Majin Buu arc. It's been a bit. I certainly hope I remember where I left off. I'm guessing the Earth is in danger, a villain is killing people, and there are a handful of characters who are each working on a method of powering up to fight the villain. Okay, phew. Nailed it. Hard to keep track of this stuff sometimes, it's all so diverse. <laughs>